All right, so thank you. Thank you, Zach, and um, good afternoon um, to everyone here, and good afternoon to everyone who is, uh, who is online. Um, well, first of all, um, many thanks to Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung uh, and to um, the Stifterverband, to BMBF and to uh, the Stiftung Innovation in der Hochschullehre for the invitation. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here for the 10th year anniversary of the Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung. So well done to you for, you know, 20 more, 30 more, whatever you can manage. Um, and um, I will speak today a little bit about um, the work that we do at the European level. And I can already um, uh, appreciate a lot the fact that you are first here or online and that you're listening to that because it is a little bit further from the higher education area specifically, but I will try to make it relevant for you. And secondly, of course, it's five o'clock in the evening, so maybe some of you want to have a drink and this I understand completely, but uh, bear with me. So I hope that you will find it uh, useful to some, to some extent at least. So I will talk about the work that I lead at, at the European level, which is the uh, European uh, digital Education Action Plan, and I would like to share with you some, uh, some reflections on what we have learned from the work so far, and maybe some of the thoughts that will guide us in the, in the next uh, stage. Now, um, the motto of this event is uh, Tales of Tomorrow, <clears throat> and um, every compelling tale uh, has uh, some sort of conflict, and nowadays we, we call them challenges, because we prefer to, to talk, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this way. Uh, but effectively, uh, there is um, just the same old tension that you have a problem to solve and that um, you uh, are doing whatever you can uh, to mobilize your stakeholders. And this is exactly, I think, what is happening here. So first of all, congratulations for the format on, on, on managing this also in this quite uh, um, impressive location, but also on the people that you have brought together. And by way of analogy, I would say this is also what we did when we first uh, set up the Digital Education Action Plan, which is a, um, a flagship policy on digital education. Uh, if I may add, um, the, the first one that has um, attempted to create a digital education policy over a long term uh, to integrate the different measures at EU level. And this is why also you see this very long-term duration, which is uh, 21 and 27. It's not because we can predict the future. It's because this is the financial cycle of the European Union. And uh, the European Union, as you know, is a little bit like a, like a big tanker in a way. So it has a long uh, way to, 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 to move. But uh, when it decides to go somewhere, then it normally focuses um, its um, priorities over a longer term. And um, we have developed this action plan back in 2020, which was a completely different time, and when the challenges that we have had were of completely different nature. And um, I have uh, tried to um, perhaps think, first of all, before I tell you a bit more about the action plan, I, I wanted to share with you some of the reflections we have when it comes to higher education, and which are probably a little bit more specific for, for you. Um, first of all, I think it is very, very fair to say that um, it is very challenging to adapt the digital transformation to, uh, to education. And also the universities and higher, higher education institutions um, they really need to keep uh, pace with the very rapid acceleration of, of um, digital in Europe. And this is, you can observe everywhere. And uh, this involves not only putting, you know, new digital tools, um, but also uh, the continuous maintenance or the upgrade of technology infrastructure. It also now includes a lot of um, new problems such as, the, well, not so new, but uh, more novel problems such as cybersecurity, uh, interoperability, scalability of solutions, and of course, performance. And um, I think that what we s saw through COVID is how important that is. So that was a lesson number one. Then, um, very important, and someone spoke earlier today in a panel which I was looking at uh, from there, um, about the, the notion that uh, when it comes to digital skills, there is more that higher education can do still. And I will come back to that when I show you the picture of digital skills today in Europe. I will show you some figures so that you see that. But 
my point here is that the universities have a very important role when it comes to the development of digital skills. Of course, now you can apply this to the AI discussion that uh, all of us are having. But um, both students and also educators require sufficient digital literacy to manage. And this is not always given. And um, I would also add a caveat that uh, some of the problem, of course, comes from much earlier. So it's not a problem at the higher education level only, but it stems from, from much earlier. And I'll say something to this later on. Now, there is, of course, the very important and big problem of the funding, which is, um, I mean, as long as I have been involved in higher education or in education and um, um, innovation policy, there has always been the issue of funding shortfalls. And this uh, is a problem which has been, again, exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think that here in Germany, which I also know a little bit um, from my personal experience, I think this problem is also existing, so there is a um, funding shortage when it comes to uh, promoting online learning or uh, linking this to research activities. And so there is a continuous need for this type of um, uh, funding as well. And then I want to, to, to make one more point um, on the issue of inclusivity and equality, um, which is a very important one for societal um, um, balance and uh, where we still see continuously uh, a need for greater diversity, for greater gender equality in higher education with a persistent under underrepresentation of specific um, disadvantaged groups and, and parts of the, of the population. And um, also we should not forget that the ability of people to participate in digital education sometimes is completely contingent on um, their access and the reality is that um, access is not uh, is not uh, universal in the European Union. So there is a lot of work that we, we need to still do at the level of the basics. So let me let me mention now a bit on the on the question how we through the digital education action plan have addressed uh, addressed some of it. First of all, I would like you to remember just two parts about this, this um, very high level action plan. And this is the, the, the two main objectives. And if you would manage to do that, I would be very, very happy. The first big, very long term objective is to really support the development of an ecosystem, um, a digital education ecosystem, which is uh, performing and which provides for access. And I imagine this not differently from the notion of the university where everybody can go to. If you're, if you're handicapped, you can even, um, you know, have the specific entry. You have all the facilities which you need. You have a space and it needs to be a space equipped and adapted to the process of the learning. This is a big task in itself because it involves uh, questions around infrastructure, digital tools, platforms, digital education content, and all of this is a very expensive investment, but it needs to be done. And it is something where we cannot compromise because it is about access. And if education is a human right, then access to education in digital terms should also be treated like this. Then the other big priority we have is the question of enhancing digital skills. I spoke about it extremely important in terms of the big priorities uh, at the European level, but also for uh, inclusion and for just participating in society. So I think that this um, is something that we like to refer nowadays as the fourth basic skill next to reading, literacy and math. And this uh, type of basic digital skills we need to establish as early as possible throughout the different, uh, the different curricula. We also um, make a very important point of getting and keeping the different actors of the digital education ecosystem together. Let's not forget that this is an ecosystem which is fairly new. So comparatively speaking to the education system, we're talking about the last decade or so, maybe a little bit more. So it is very important to bring these different actors together. And this is something which we do through the digital education hub. And I will say something about it a little bit later. Um, I said only two things um, to remember. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I, have, I, I do have um, details, but I would not um, elaborate uh, on them right now because you can access the different um, actions of the Digital Education Action Plan. I just say that there is a number of specific policy measures which 
we and the, uh, the Commission and the member states, the 27 member states, discuss and agree on. And there are some instruments here where uh, the different member states commit to. And there is also a number of specific actions um, related to the development of connectivity, which we fund, digital education content where we develop uh, quality standards for new type of digital education content together with stakeholders, or um, one of the successful, recently more successful uh, measures is um, the ethical guidelines on uh, the use of AI and data in education and training. And you can guess why this is so relevant today. I, I am not going to say too, too much on it. Uh, same, uh, same logic applies on the second priority. We are um, uh, working on the development of a European Digital Skills Certificate, which would, in a way, provide some sort of certification for digital skills in the same way you know this from the languages. So A1, A2, and so on, the, the type of uh, classification. We also have uh, specific measures to support mobility and uh, traineeships. Uh, so this is something which is relevant for higher education mobility. So it's a more specialized way to go uh, abroad through Erasmus and to develop more digital skills. And these are some of the examples that um, um, I have listed here under the um, uh, second priority. I want to um, mention just a few figures here so that you, you um, um, uh, get a, a, um, a grasp a bit of the... Um, let's say, overall um, situation still uh, in terms of the, the different uh, benchmarks that we, that we use. Uh, the, first, um, the first thing I would like to mention is that in a, in a recent um, um, work that we have done together with the member states and which the member states have agreed on, and I'm sorry for the very long title, which is Council Recommendation on the Key Enabling Factors for Successful Digital Education and Training. So this is some of the peculiarities of our job that we have to be extremely specific sometimes. Um, we have listed uh, a couple of data points which I think are very pertinent um, and you can understand immediately probably why this is such an important issue still. So first, um, first point that you can see here is that um, only one third of um, uh, students attend schools which have um, strategies on how to use digital in, um, in their teaching and learning processes. Only, only one third have this explicitly. Only four out of 10 teachers feel confident to use digital, school, uh, digital tools in their teaching and learning practice. And one of the, one of the major um, insights which I, which I really want to point you to, because one of the countries which has be, been investigated is, in fact, the one that we're in right now, is this here, which says that only 2 to 15% of the schools audited by the European Court of Auditors, so this is something like the Rechnungshof in Germany, so it looks at where money is being spent at the European level, so only 2 to 15% of the schools uh, of the investigated six countries, one of which is, is, is Germany, have gigabit connectivity access. And um, this means effectively that all of you, including me, who have a uh, probably an, like a 4G or 5G phone, we have better connectivity than a lot of schools in those countries. And uh, if you think about it for a moment, um, it's not ideal. And also it explains why you have problems further, you know, impacting also the higher education. We have proposed and the member states have agreed last November after quite intensive negotiations uh, because let me remind you that um, the, the issue of education is dealt with at the European Commission level in the same way the issue of education is dealt with in Germany by the lender. I'm, I'm just giving you this analogy. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's more or less the same. So it's not easy to, 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 to put it simply, but still the member states have agreed upon the proposal of the Commission to uh, inter alia develop national strategies to work more closely between the different departments, because in order to create ecosystems, you need infrastructure, you need finance people. You cannot do this out of your education ministry, no matter how good you are. And um, you, um, you need to work with the private sector as well together. And we have um, also uh, managed to um, negotiate a few other uh, measures which the member states have agreed and will be implementing in the next um, a few years. 
A second policy work which I want to mention very briefly is on digital skills and competences. Why this is such an important thing? Because you may think, oh, this is such an old, uh, you know, uh, old, uh, like Alta Vine. Uh, it's, it's really a very important topic which has been um, neglected for a very, very long time. And again, um, one third of the students of 15 years, so it's uh, 14 to 15 years old, one third of them are rated as underachievers in digital skills. And the tests which are applied are not very advanced. So we're talking here about a very significant part of the school population which uh, really underperforms um, and has uh, lacks basic digital skills. At the European level, a very um, revealing statistics, which unfortunately is not changing a lot over time, or at least in the, in the time I'm following this in the last uh, four or five years, is this one, which is that it is only around half of the population, and here we are talking about 16 to 74 years old, which have basic digital skills. Again, the, the baseline to, to say you have that is relatively low. The test has been developed quite some time ago. So we're not talking about some very advanced competences here. And um, I want to just say two things about it. First, we are very far away from our own target, which the member states have agreed, which is 80%. Um, so we are really very far away from it. And the second is that, increasingly, as digitalization moves into every aspect of life, including participation in social life and citizenship, this becomes an exclusion. Um, um, point. So it is very important to not forget that, no matter how important, of course, all the technological revolution is uh, with, uh, with AI and other things. We really need to make sure that we don't leave um, a very big part of the population um, outside. And um, on the question of gender, um, the, the, the statistics is um, um, Basically, it's a huge imbalance when it comes to the ICT professions. And um, even though some countries have very high levels of female graduates, first of all, they don't always manage to go into the profession. And then secondly, this does not apply to the majority of countries, which still have very low uh, ICT graduates uh, in terms of the female population. And the result is that, um, well, 81% of the ICT professionals are, are male <clears throat> with all the conclusions this has and with all, let's say, the results you can see in terms of who programs what, in, in what way. So, um, again, after a, a quite an intensive negotiation with the member states uh, last year, we have, as part of the, the Digital Education Action Plan, we have um, agreed that the member states will um, develop um, specific um, instruments such as um, let's say, integrate more informatics into um, education or um, start as early as possible in the provision of digital skills, meaning that they would also teach the logics and the, the computational thinking even without screens, because we know that this is not uh, always uh, perhaps uh, welcome, especially for the younger uh, children, but that there would be a continuum and also more importantly, there would be a, some sort of assessment and follow up because again, this is not, not yet there. It is very difficult for, for um, a person like, let's say, me to, to demonstrate and to, to um, provide you evidence of what my digital skills are. So I'm just taking myself as an example. I could take uh, a student as well. I want to, I want to mention uh, on the way um, um, the European Digital Education Hub, where also the Stifterverband and the Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung are uh, partners, and uh, I want to mention it because I think it's one of the um, very interesting activities that we have set out um, in 2021 to, uh, to do. And um, this is a flagship uh, to bring together a community working on digital education and to provide space for uh, stakeholders from different sectors to come together. And uh, this has turned into something like uh, 4,000 plus um, practitioners today from importantly all the different sectors so it involves a very heavy part on higher education but it does have also schools or vocational education and training and um, it has uh, the at least i would say the ambition that uh, it works in an agile manner so it is much more demand driven and fast 
Uh, it includes um, activities such as um, workshops, ask me anything uh, sessions, accelerator programs and uh, some mentoring. And also the idea is to bring in thematic work groups, people who are specialists in a certain field and can work out relatively fast uh, specific solutions. So not to wait uh, for too long, um, um, uh, let's say, results and um, to um, empower actually the people who are working on the ground. And I think that you are also um, welcome to, if, you, if you're interested, to join this community of practice. One example how this could be relevant for higher education is um, the uh, interoperability frame framework, which we have uh, recently seen being launched in the Digital Education Hub, um, which consists of around 140 higher education stakeholders and IT experts with um, different, let's say, backgrounds uh, who collaborate together to address several infrastructural challenges. Uh, which prevent higher education institutions from working better together. I mean, these could be very simple things like exchanging the diploma of a student uh, or the, the record, rather, of a student who wants to move from University of Berlin to, let's say, University of Ljubljana. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying like this. It can go into much more complicated questions such as how is it that uh, you can cooperate more effectively in the European University Alliances, which is a... Uh, initiative uh, that the Commission launched a few years ago to bring much deeper integration in the European higher education landscape. And um, it relates to things like uh, virtual mobility, joint programs, joint courses. So here there is a core group of around 20 experts from the higher education domain and also um, organizations um, uh, from the European University Foundation, many universities or uh, university alliances, and together they are developing what hopefully will be a higher education interoperability framework, um, which um, we hope, because this is a longer term process being, being related to standardization, which hope will also lay a little bit down the foundation for a EU-wide type of standards on uh, data exchange for higher education systems. Um, so this is a very specific example of how uh, such an activity works and we expect um, later this year to see the um, results of this um, framework in place. This is just the timeline of the um, initiative which shows you when it started in, in January and then we expect uh, the result more or less in, in February. It's not exactly a sprint, but it, it needs a little bit of time. So on the other hand, and I think it's a great example of um, how uh, different actors work together at the European level. I, I want to finish with um, a just um, um, a reference to the fact uh, of the way forward, because I, I mentioned some lessons learned, uh, I mentioned some reflections, and I want to mention also the way forward. In this moment, we are at a very important stage that we are launching our um, evaluation of what we have done in the last three years. So what you heard from me is also a little bit part of my reflection, uh, my personal experience with it. And um, we uh, have around about three more years to go and we really want to look at what worked well, what worked less well, and then see what we completely missed. And um, we have launched uh, for this last month, um, actually it's end of April, so it's a bit more. We launched um, the entire process and we are inviting stakeholders, and here I would like to extend this invitation to you as well. We are inviting stakeholders to share your um, views and opinions, ideally in a position paper, uh, up to 1,000 words, so it's not that long. And we have also um, set out to organize a number of consultation events with specific sectors. We already kicked, it, kicked this off with the business sector and all of this will follow up, including the member states, including the next European Parliament, which will be elected in a matter of a uh, few days. And we want to um, publish the results of this, including any new measures that we want to promote and uh, put forward for the action plan in the second quarter of the um, next year. So I will finish with a call. Uh, so you can participate in this review. This is the email address if you, if you would like to do so. Otherwise, you can also, of course, uh, find us uh, on the relevant links. Um, thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks a lot, Georgi, for joining us today. Uh, I'll just put my laptop there, then I can see the questions more easily. Join me on my left, and then I can just read here. Oh, see, we have some incoming questions. And if there's more questions, use this opportunity to send them quickly. So, uh, let's see, Jens wrote, the EU was more than 10 years ago setting up a very interesting collaborative publication on the future of education 2030 with the facilitation of JRC in Sevilla. Lots of stakeholders involvement and he was wondering whether this amazing joint effort could be repeated given that there is so much technological dynamic nowadays. Why is the EDEH not taking care of something like that? So the European Collaboration Platform. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, the EDEH is uh, the European Digital Education Hub. So thanks, Jens, for, shout, for the shout out. Uh, I will say that uh, it's not really up to the Commission what the hub will decide to do. So everyone can kick off an idea and just do it. That's the whole point of the community. Um, so you're welcome also to initiate this, Jens, but more on the question of the GRC and what happened in the past, because GRC stands for a part of the European Commission and you, you're excused if you don't know that, but it's the, it's the research house of the European Commission. It's a huge body with a lot of foresight uh, specialists. It runs uh, some of the uh, research activities, inclu including the nuclear activities, um, nuclear uh, research activities of the Commission. So very strong scientific uh, expertise. And yes, they did that. And actually, they are working together with us uh, currently on some of the implications of the um, uh, recent uh, AI Act, uh, the, the recent digital uh, legislation, which has a big impact on education and training. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody here by saying that uh, I, I mean, I do think that uh, the implications will be at least as big as GDPR. They might be even bigger and we need to be better prepared for that. So we are not doing this, let's say, out of the blue right now, what will be the education in the future, but we are turning more as to what do we have as the baseline and what is also the regulations which are uh, agreed by the member states and how that affects education. And the GRC is doing that with us together. We have another question by Anna Hall. As a student, I really want to see Macron's vision of a European university in place. Right now, there are still so many obstacles. How can you push that interoperability? Is that, oh, that interoperability is really working for me as a student. Uh, well, thank you, for the, for, <laughs> thank you for the question. So I think the, the reason behind we, um, we set out to work on interoperability at the EU level and working also on the domain of education already tells you that we believe this is an extremely important point. I can tell you that it's not the most uh, maybe natural thing for um, uh, politicians to deal with, but we believe it's a very important point. It helps a lot um, uh, the problems of the student to, so to solve the problem of the student. And what I presented briefly here in terms of this framework, I hope will um, help the universities to just link better together and contribute to, to what, uh, what the, uh, the questioner um, uh, has, has asked. Uh, I, of course, you know, cannot provide a guarantee for that, but we have a commitment to work on it for sure. Now, in my introduction, I said you've worked in a startup, you've worked in a large corporation, now in the EU. Um, how big is the difference? And what is needed to really push forward, you know, um, great ideas around education? That's a great question. That's yours, no? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I will say that there is not much similarity at all. Um, I worked in a very small company, very small startup in the tech field um, and then in a big corporation. I think there is one big similarity and uh, it comes back to, if you, if you allow me, to, to a French word, to, to actually to two French words, which funnily enough, you know, they come from the French language and at the same time, they cannot mean more different things. One is the word bureaucrat. The other word is entrepreneur. Both of them come from the French language. This is already very, I would say, interesting in itself if you're interested in languages like me. But why I'm saying it is because if you have an uh, entrepreneurial attitude, um, you can actually do things everywhere, no matter how big the organization is. And this is maybe the only thing that I would say is kind of similar. 
Other than this, there is, of course, a, a huge level of uh, responsibility that you, you have to take for, for bigger things if you work in a big organization and you need to, to put some, some different skills, of course, in, in, your, in, in your pocket, in your portfolio. Um, because also the machine is just much, much bigger. Mm. But if you have a little bit of that, that you can actually do a little bit yourself and you, you are confident about this, and I think this is helpful for everyone, then probably... I yeah. think it's probably a helpful skill wherever you are in which organization exactly. ever. If you're proactive, exactly. if you learn how to work exactly. the system and approach it entrepreneurial, you're able to change things. Exactly. Thanks a lot for Thank doing you, that Doug. on our behalf in the European Commission. Thank Georgi you, Dimitrov. Thank you. <laughs>